All right. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. Hello, everybody, once again, and welcome to the 2022 Hulk Global Prize Finals, excuse me, Prize Global Finals. It is my great pleasure to host this event. My name is Dexter Henry. I'm a sports reporter and anchor for the New York Post, and I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. As you know, today we will hear six startups pitch their ideas that address the 2022 challenge, getting the world back to work. The winning team, they're gonna get a great prize, which will be selected by our distinguished judges. They will receive a $1 million prize. That's a great one, everybody, to make their dream a reality and create 2,000 meaningful jobs in the next two years. Now, we're thrilled to have all you guys here today. And we're gonna get started by welcoming to the stage the CEO of the Holt Prize, Lori Van Dam. Hi, everybody. How we feeling? We're excited. I also want to say hi to all of our friends who are watching and are viewing parties around the world, Nairobi, Mumbai, Mexico City, Tunis, and so many more. Hello and welcome. It is such an honor to be here with you today. Although I am new to the Hult Prize, in fact, this event marks my one-year anniversary leading the team, I am certainly not new to our sponsor organization. I spent the first half of my career with EF Education First, which included serving, actually, as the first interim CEO of the Hult International Business School when it became an independent educational institution in 2003. After 20 fantastic years with EF, I decided to explore the nonprofit world. So with EF's blessing, I pursued leadership roles at charitable organizations like the One Fund Boston, serving the marathon survivor community, and most recently with Susan G. Komen, the breast cancer charity. I was deeply honored when I was asked to rejoin the Halt community to lead the Halt Price Foundation into its second decade of success. This truly is my dream job. It brings together all the aspects I've enjoyed most about my career, working with young people around the world, finding collaborative solutions to big challenges, being part of an organizational culture that has preserved its entrepreneurial agility after nearly six decades of success while leveraging the resources, reach, and impact of a global education company. I am genuinely in awe of everything the Hult Prize participants have accomplished over the years. Our students have tackled some of the world's most complex challenges with game-changing social enterprises that combat world hunger, unemployment, and water shortages, protect the environment and regenerate nature, and empower vulnerable communities. One of our most successful Hult Prize winners to date is Aspire Food Group. In 2013, the Aspire team from McGill took home the prize with their innovative idea of farming palm larvae to feed crickets, which they make into a sustainable protein source to feed the world. Just under a decade later, the Aspire team generates over $20 million in annual revenue, has secured over $20 million in venture capital, employs 80 team members, runs the world's largest cricket farm in Canada, holds 12 patents, and has been featured in both Forbes 30 Under 30 and Fast Company's list of 100 world-changing ideas. Mohamed Ashour, who is the founder and CEO of Aspire, has recorded a video message that I want to share with you now. The Holt Prize is so much more than an idea. It's a global community of impact. I remember in 2013, when I was a medical student and well on my way to pursue my lifelong dream of becoming a neurosurgeon, receiving that email that completely changed my life. And it was an invitation, really more a dare, to build a business that at its very core can address the problem of global hunger. It's almost been 10 years since we won the Holt Prize, and I'm sitting today in our commercial facility in Ontario in Canada, which is a $100 million project Aspire is now a commercial business with multinational focus and exports in many markets. 
and still centrally focused on the very same call to action that the Holt Prize inspired all these years ago. And it's the long-term desire to create sustained impact in so many communities while doing so in a financially responsible and sustainable manner. I wish you all the very best in pursuing these game-changing business ideas that are going to make a tremendous positive impact on our planet. And I thank all of you and the judges and the entire Holt Prize Foundation and organization for the work that you do to continue to inspire so many entrepreneurs in the world, including people like myself, who never grew up thinking they would become business leaders, to become the next generation of impact makers around the world. I hope to see you all next year. That's pretty impressive, right? You can imagine crickets and all of those bins back there. That said, it's not just our Hull Prize winners who continue to change the world. For example, in 2014, one of our global finalist teams, which did not win the million dollars, out of the University of Pennsylvania, proposed to eradicate tooth decay in urban slums with xylitol chewing gum. While Sweet Bites did not continue ultimately, team member Eric Cowderer Abrams went on to co-found Detect, a health tech firm in Connecticut that has recently received $78 million in funding from the National Institutes of Health to advance the development of a rapid at-home COVID-19 test kit. These success stories, and so many more like them, make all of us at the Hull Prize even more passionate about and committed to our goal of inspiring student entrepreneurs to solve the world's biggest challenges by launching innovative startups with positive impact. During these turbulent times, it is so reassuring that there's a generation of young people out there who are deeply committed to being better custodians of the planet, being kinder and fairer and more understanding of each other, regardless of their birthplace or personal identity or cultural heritage, and dedicating their lives to a new way of doing business based on healthy, humane, and sustainable growth. To each and every one of the 100,000 students in 120 countries who participated this year, I am hugely optimistic about the future you have envisioned. You have proven once again by joining over a million Hult Prize alumni that you do indeed have the ideas that will transform the way we live on this planet. We will be here to inspire and support you in whichever way we can in making that happen. So, go change the world. Thank you. Thank you all. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to a longtime colleague and friend who recently served as Hull Prize's interim CEO and who is now the Chief Administrative Officer of EF Education First, one of our prime sponsors. Martha and I have worked together side by side in many capacities over the last 30 years, and she has been involved with the Hull Prize since the very beginning. Please join me in welcoming Martha Doyle. Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be here on behalf of EF Education First which has been a proud sponsor of the Holt Prize since day one. EF's mission is to open the world through education. Today we have 52,000 employees in 100 offices around the globe. We come from every single background and identity, but we are all driven by a shared single belief that the world is a better place when people try to understand one another across cultures and borders and languages. When I was young, my mother always told me that one person can make a difference. And I must admit, I didn't believe her. She would share stories of heroes or leaders or inventors. And I always thought that those people were just special Ordinary people couldn't actually make a difference. And yet, here we are, in a room filled with student entrepreneurs 
from every single corner of the world who have created amazing social enterprises to solve some of the world's biggest problems. What makes an ordinary person turn into a hero or a leader or an inventor? It's not where you come from. It's not what college you attend. It's what lies within you. 60 years ago, EF's founder, Bertel Holt, was a college student, an ambitious college student, just like many of you in this room. He had enormous entrepreneurial spirit and a dream of making things better. Bertel grew up in Sweden and he, had, he was profoundly dyslexic, which meant that he always struggled in a traditional classroom setting. Back then, no one really understood dyslexia, and so teachers thought that Bertel was stupid or lazy. But he knew he wasn't stupid. And in fact, he felt absolutely sure that there was another way to learn that didn't involve reading. So he actually dropped out of high school and landed himself a job in a local bank as an errand boy, which is about the most entry-level job that you could have. But being ambitious, he decided that if he was going to be an errand boy, he was going to be the best errand boy that that bank had ever seen. Now, one of his core skills is to make processes more efficient. And since his main job was to sort the mail and then deliver it to bank executives, he came up with a system to sort the mail faster. He then mapped out the best route, and then he literally ran through the bank, timing himself so that he could see if he improved on the time from the day before. This caught the eye of one of the bank executives who came down one day to the mailroom to find the running boy. When he heard Bertel's story and saw his system, he decided to help him. He told Bertel that if he was not going to go to college, he needed to at least learn English. And he sent him to work in the London branch of the bank for one summer. Three months later, Bertel could speak English. He didn't learn it in a school. He didn't learn it from a book. He learned it by being immersed in an English-speaking country, doing his job, ordering tea, making friends, just living his life. And that's where the original idea of EF came from. When Bertel returned to Sweden, he did enroll in university. By then, though, he knew that his career path was not going to be traditional. He knew there were many more students out there just like him who learned better by doing something than by reading about it. So from his dorm room, Bertel set up a new company to take groups of students abroad during their summer vacation to learn English in the mornings and then practice it in the afternoons, playing sports, meeting friends, having fun, seeing the sights, and connecting with other students through English. Little did Bertel know that he would one day be considered a pioneer of the experiential learning movement, and that the company he founded from his dorm room would become the world's largest private education company. This same entrepreneurial spirit was what ber propelled Bertel to launch the Halt International Business School in 2003. He believed that business education needed to be totally reimagined to keep pace with an interconnected global world. His vision was for HALT was to take students out of the classroom and encourage them to solve real problems for real companies in real time. And ever since that executive, that bank executive took a chance on Bertel, he has in turn always tried to support other young people with big ambitions and big dreams. It's what led him to fund the Holt Prize competition each year with his own personal money. And it's in his honor that his four sons, who now either run EF or run enterprises of their own, 
are carrying the tradition forward. One person can make a difference. Each of you is already doing it. This is only the beginning of your story. And whether or not you win today is not what will matter. What will matter is if you are passionate about the problem you are trying to solve. What will matter is if you are willing to work harder than anyone else. What will matter is if you know what you are uniquely good at and then figure out how to become great at it. And what will matter is your courage. As Johann Wolfgang van Goethe once said, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. For boldness has magic, genius, and power in it. Good luck today and thank you. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the new president of the Halt International Business School, Dr. Matt Lilly. Though Matt had just joined the team a few months ago, everyone at Halt, from students to faculty, are already raving about the enormous positive impact he is having. And I suspect when we look back after his first year, we will see the dazzling difference he has made. Please welcome Dr. Matt Lilly. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Martha mentioned, Holt International Business School was founded 19 years ago with the simple aim of improving the way that business is taught. Our education is designed to give students the knowledge and skills needed by employers now. And since, as we all know, you can only really learn by doing, our education centers around putting theory into practice. We now have 4,000 undergraduate and postgraduate students from over 120 countries at our campuses in Boston, in London, in San Francisco, and in Dubai doing just that. Everything we do at Holt is to enable people to make an impact that matters, and ultimately, to help create a future that's better for everyone. Because we believe that business, done ethically, is the biggest driver of progress, not only economic growth, but also the spread of prosperity across our planet. I love the Holt Prize, because like Holt International Business School, it's driven by the beliefs that business can be a force for good in our world, and that bringing people from the whole world together stimulates our thinking, allows us to learn about and from different cultures, makes us better leaders, and leads to better solutions. For the students taking part, the Holt Prize also offers a crash course in some of the things that we aspire to teach in our business school with our innovative, challenge-based curricula. Things like turning your passions and dreams into your future career, thinking big and out of the box, getting the best and most diverse minds to solve real problems in real time, and learning by doing, failing fast, and improving. But most importantly, I love the Holt Prize because it changes people. It encourages people who never thought they could to be entrepreneurs and to work together to create a better world. We like to say that Holt International Business School is for those made to do. It's also true for the thousands of student entrepreneurs who compete each year in the Holt Prize. That's why I'm thrilled to be able to announce that the Holt Prize Foundation and Holt International Business School will be collaborating more closely on a new research project that will enhance the missions of both organizations. We'll study the mindsets, personality traits, and motivations of social entrepreneurs by surveying and interviewing Holt Prize participants, past, present, and future. Basically, we want to find out what makes entrepreneurs tick. To date, most 
of the research in this field, as you might imagine, is US-centric. Since Hulk Prize competitors come from over 120 countries, they'll offer a unique insight into which traits are universally human and which are culturally specific. It will help us to improve the experience of future Hulk Prize participants, but it will also help to enhance how we at Hulk International Business School deliver our social entrepreneurship programs. In closing, I'd like to congratulate all of this year's participating Hulk Prize teams. During these past 12 months, you've undertaken an amazing, incredible education, and I greatly admire you for doing that. I'm confident that it will set you up for future success as a social entrepreneur. For the five remaining teams, I wish you good luck today. And regardless of the outcome, all the best in turning your dreams into reality and changing the world. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lori, Martha, and Matt, for your words of wisdom. We greatly appreciate it. And there's no doubt that the Hulk Prize fits beautifully within this global community that has put youth and education at its center through education, travel, and language programs. Looking around this room and hearing about all of the things that are happening within the EF and the Hulk family of companies, I personally am truly inspired. It's so fitting that we are having our global finals as part of the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting for the first time since 2016. And as many of you know, President Clinton has been a longtime supporter of the Hulk Prize, even going so far as to name the Hulk Prize one of the top five ideas changing the world in an article in Time Magazine. So, with that being said, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you very much. Whoa, thank you. That made this whole thing worth doing. You know, you just proved one of Clinton's laws of politics and psychology. Other things equal, being equal, you'd rather stand up and shout than point a finger and call people names. <laughs> it's great. I want to thank Lori and all the people at Holt, as well as the Holt family, that this competition has become a big part of my life for the last <clears throat> little more than a decade. I first became involved in 2011, and it's become like an annual tradition. And uh, <clears throat> it's amazing how uh, good a lot of these projects are. I want to say a special word of thanks to the judges who make the projects good, <clears throat> because I'm glad that they had to make the decisions and I don't. <laughs> Anytime somebody wants me to make a Hard decision. I said, I made decisions for years. You make decisions. <laughs> it's not my problem anymore. Of course it is. But I do think you're doing something that's very important. And uh, Secretary Walsh, who's an old friend of mine, is going to be presenting this year's award. <clears throat> I also want to thank him and congratulate all the student teams for their ideas and their hard work. To me, the Holt Prize offers a glimpse of the future, the one we should all be striving for, not the one we're afraid we're careening toward. It reminds us that we are actually still 
people who have free will, a certain amount of autonomy, and an ability to change the course of our own history and that of others. And that, I think, is very important. One of the things that, that has not changed very much in the 20 plus years since I walked out of the White House is that we, are live, in an, we live in a highly, highly interdependent world. That is, you know, the things we do have consequences for people near and far. The things they do have consequences for us near and far. They may be good, they may be bad. Human life being what it is, in many cases, they'll be both. But I think it's really important that we reaffirm the importance of the Hulk Prize as an example of interdependence made positive by conscious thought and effort. Because every day, even in my older years, I still try every day to make a positive difference by thought or effort, or both. It, you have to try. So I remember the biggest rush I got, I think, doing the health prizes was back in 2012, and the team that won the con competition was, it was a clean energy competition. And uh, the team that won was New York University's Abu Dhabi campus in the UAE. The interesting thing was that there were four members of the team. One was from India, one was from Pakistan. One was from the China, the other was from Taiwan. And they were all on the team together. So I said, as if I were showing insight, <laughs> I said, what was it like? And he said, uh, we're so over that. <laughs> we're just people to each other. We want to work together and do things. That, in a way, is what the whole prize is all about. The, all the politicians want to make sure you're wearing the right color suit to the parade. The people who put people first make sure you take everybody's talent, put it together, and get the result that we need. So that's my memory. Now, as you'll see over the course of this afternoon, all the finalists in this year's competition have also done impressive work that will help more people around the world fulfill their potential. This year's challenge was important and timely to help put the world back to work after the COVID-19 pandemic by creating social enterprises that will employ 2,000 people by 2024. Over the course of the last year, more than 15,000 teams from more than 2,000 universities in 120 countries took part in the challenge. If they all stick to their plans and meet the targets, they collectively can create more than 30 million jobs by 2024. That's quite a number for university students and people just coming up. I think this is profoundly important because I believe work is not just about making a living, even though that's essential. For many people, at least of my generation, work is fundamental to human dignity and our sense of self-worth. 
And unfortunately, through no fault of their own, there are millions and millions and millions of people in the world today who don't know whether they feel that way anymore because it seems so peripheral to their lives that they, their lives just seem stuck. Oh, maybe they've got a job, but it's maybe not a very good job. And being stuck is very important. It's far worse over the long run than being poor. As long as you have the power to take yourself out of poverty. Being stuck is an awful thing. It's good looking in the mirror every day and thinking that every single one of my tomorrows is going to be just like yesterday. And I am completely powerless to change that. Changing that not just for yourself, but for others. It's one of the most noble objectives, I believe, that anyone could ever have. Being stuck is dangerous. When you feel left out, left behind, overlooked, you become vulnerable to us versus them, resentment-based politics. And pretty soon it starts to creep into other parts of your life. Being powerless is not good. And we have to make sure, all of us, each in our own way, after all the dislocations that, was caused, that were caused by the COVID epidemic, there will be many things that need to become unstuck. And we need to help as many people as we can unstick them. So, we're going to move on to the pitches now, but I have one more job to do, which I'm really tickled to do for reasons you will soon understand, and that is to announce next year's Halt Call to Action, redesigning fashion to make it more sustainable. Good topic, right? The uh, clothing is a basic need. It helps to keep us warm, keep us cool. In most of our societies, keep us more decent. <laughs> it also helps us to express our personal identity and cultural affinities. It's the world's third largest manufacturing sector contributing $2.4 trillion to the global economy every year, employing more than 300 million people. Unfortunately, this comes at a steep environmental and social cost. The apparel industry is responsible for about 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions consumes 215 trillion liters of water a year, accounts for 9% of the microplastics found in our oceans. For the majority of workers, conditions are poor and pay is often below a livable wage, especially for women who make up 80% of the workforce. It's clear that we need new approaches to fashion from how we source textiles and how we manufacture garments to how we buy and dispose of them. The good news is there are already forward-looking members of the fashion industry doing really good work that is inspiring to others. I saw a lot of that, uh, especially in my work in Haiti after the earthquake, where longtime friends like Donna Karen and Kenneth Cole and innovative new designers like Victor Glamaud and Zede Jean-Pierre, work with local artisans to develop new designs and use natural materials and recycled products. At this meeting, we have an exciting new commitment from the Smallholder Farmers Alliance with partners including Timberland to introduce regenerative cotton among its members in Haiti. 
both to improve the livelihood of the farmers and to make their crops more sustainable. There's a lot of more important work being done in this area. And I know that the teams from this year's whole competition will make a big contribution. But I have to, you have to allow me one little point of personal pressure. I probably should have been cons what is, conscripted into being a judge this year because for the last several years, my presidential library in Arkansas has sponsored an event called Curbside Couture. And we put out a book on it every year. And all these young people, some of them as young as nine and 10 years old, design fashion out of essentially trash and waste material. And it's amazing. They have a lot of fun doing it. The rest of us have a lot of fun watching it. And it's actually gotten a whole lot of people who otherwise I think would have thought it was some sort of liberal political plot. It's gotten a lot of people to really think about the impact of any human activity on the larger environment. What are you using? What are you wasting? What are you recycling? How does it impact? And if you start with the end in mind, then the politics can't get in the way. Just think about that. So, thank you judges for judging this year. Thank you contestants for stepping up. And thanks to the Hope Prize for trying to show us that cooperation beats conflict every time. And that we can nearly always do something better than we're doing it in ways that help more people to get and stay unstuck. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President Clinton. We are always inspired by your commitment to improving the world we live in, and we're so grateful for your ongoing support. Who knew? Couture, curbside couture. I'm going to check that out. So who is excited about next year's challenge about fashion, right? I think we're going to see a lot of innovative and creative ideas for tackling these important issues. And if we're going to be talking about the process of producing and selling clothing, it seems only fitting that in 2023, we hold our global finals in a city that is world famous for fashion. So it is my enormous pleasure to announce that our 2023 global finals will take place in Paris, France. So get your plane tickets. <laughs> That's not the only big change for 2023. Over the years, the Holt family has been so impressed with the startups, not just the ones who win, but the ones that make it to our global finals. They would like to see even more Holt Prize startups have the opportunity to turn their ideas into thriving companies. So for 2023, they will be, be providing several smaller seed capital grants in addition to the million dollar flagship prize. We're so excited to be able to expand our program. We will bring you more details in the coming months, but for now, can we give the Halt family a huge round of applause and gratitude for their generosity? So, lots to go with. 
for 2023. But first, we have some important work to do, and I'm going to hand it back over to Dexter. All right, guys, 2023 is going to be an exciting year. I see some people already on their phones getting their travel plans ready, as you should. You should, uh, you should definitely do that. We know it's going to be an exciting year for the Hope Prize, but who's ready to get to the main event? There we go. Okay. All right. So before we get to the main event, what I have to do is introduce our outstanding panel of judges. And these judges, they are fantastic. They are across a broad range of industries, and they share in the spirit of social entrepreneurship with our participants. So I'm really excited to introduce them to you. We're going to start off our first judge, Kareem Begur. He is the co-founder and CEO of InstaDeep. Next up, we have Janice Bryant Howroyd, founder and CEO of Act One Group. Then we have Meg Garlinghouse, Vice President, Social Impact Ad for LinkedIn. All right, and then we have Erica Karp, Chief Impact Officer at Pathstone. Then Karen Clausen. She's the content manager of public programs at the Nobel Prize Museum. <laughs> Next up is Manish Ranjan. He's the co-founder and CEO of Nano Health, and he's the winner of the 2014 Holt Prize. Then we have David Rosenberg. He's the CEO and co-founder of Aero Farms. <laughs> and last but not least, Sandy Spiker. She is the former CEO of IDEO. Those are your judges. And judges, look, I do not envy the decision that you guys have to make. It's a, a lot of pressure on you there, there so we, we will see. Uh, but you're going to need to make the decision after hearing from our student entrepreneurs, because I know each of these six startups would make a worthy winner. And we are going to hear from them in just a moment. But before we do, guys, Let's take a look at the journey that they all have been on. Every year, university students from countries all over the world gather for a chance to change it. 100,000 student entrepreneurs, 120 countries, a million dollar prize, 15,000 startups with the potential to affect every single one of us. In times that can feel disconnected, these student entrepreneurs connect. In moments when we feel uninspired, these student entrepreneurs inspire. When we fumble for the future, these student entrepreneurs help us step forward. It's a once in a lifetime experience and yeah, have made lifelong friends and I didn't expect it to be so collaborative. On a professional level, it would really help to take our business to the next level. Food waste is considered to be a sin. So we're like, we're taught culturally that we should not waste food and how we can make beer from bread. We will be able to help people embrace periods and be more uh, when it comes to sharing about their experiences and helping out the culture. We have a clear vision what we want to achieve. Going to the global finals will give us a platform to share that vision and drag along people that believe in the same vision that we do, which is to bring clean drinking water to those that really need it. I'm really, really honored that I got a chance to present my country, my university, and that is something amazing. When we go back to where we come from, we really wanted to express that mm -hmm. gratitude and also we want to express that feeling to the crowd. So thank you. Thank you, Hall Prize. Optimism isn't just alive here today, it's hard at work on tomorrow. This is Hope Prize. Welcome to the 2022 Global Finals.
All right. How are we feeling? All right, all right. I like the energy there. Are we ready to hear some pitches? There we go. So let me tell you how this is all going to work. Just a reminder, each team, they'll have four minutes to pitch, and then the judges, they will have four minutes to ask the team any questions that they have. Once all six teams have pitched, the judges will go deliberate, and then we will reconvene to hear what we've all been waiting to hear, the announcement of the winner. Now, we've been eagerly awaiting this moment, guys. Judges, are we, are we good? We're all set? Judges are ready to go. Teams, you guys ready to go? All right, that's what we want to hear. Let's welcome to the stage the first team that we'll be presenting today. That is Team Flexi. Seven years ago, I woke up in the most excruciating pain of my life. But the worst came later when I realized I would never regain my mobility. I'm Andrew, CEO of Flexi, and our mission is to fix broken systems of disability employment that impact a billion people around the globe. Australia is a leader in disability supports, healthcare, and employment targets. 56% of Aussies with a disability have a college qualification. In fact, I have five. But we haven't translated this incredible human potential into jobs. People like me face significant levels of unemployment and poverty. We experience discrimination, stereotypes, and employers who just don't understand what we're capable of. Professionals with disability like me are a huge untapped workforce. We're facing an $8.5 trillion global worker shortage. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a recruiter, and I've helped hundreds of people find meaningful careers. We believe that people with disability are not being employed and it's not due to a lack of skills or demand. And that's why at Flexi, we bridge the gap. We connect people with disability to remote tasks with our talent-starved business clients. And when it comes to the right team, we're in safe hands to look after this task because we have a combined 52 years of relevant industry experience. Every one of us has a family member or lives with disability. So how do we attract and retain talent? We offer amazing hourly rates. We're 100% remote work and you get to choose your hours as a flexi. Quite simply, it's flexibility. Businesses need flexibility too. And that's our competitive advantage with clients. I'm Candice, I'm a commercial lawyer, and I'm proud to tell you that we can offer remote-based tasks that are both cheaper and more flexible than our competitors, all while helping our clients to meet their obligations to hire people with disabilities. We have some fantastic partnerships across government and the disability sector, Plus, we're a proud Microsoft for Startups member, which means that we can scale our business digitally. Our business model differs from our competitors because we hire our talent directly into dignified jobs. They become our employees. We already have a community of fantastic future flexies, plus 17 great client leads who are keen to collaborate with us as soon as we're up and running. We have demand, but we need funding. We've identified a beachhead market in administrative services because these are perfectly suited to college-educated professionals who are working remotely. But that's just the beginning. Once we're established, we plan to scale quickly into other service lines and even into other geographic markets. So we have great client leads, great partnerships, and a great talent pool. But what about the numbers? Hi, I'm Ishari, a CPA with three finance master's degrees. High price funding will help us grow. With industry standard margins, in just three years, we will create 4,000 meaningful jobs for people living with disability, just like Andrew. We will make a $1.1 billion impact to Australia's GDP. People with disability are the world's largest minority, and most of us want to be working. 
Flexi is ready to change a billion lives and get the world back to work. All right. Let's hear it for Flexi once again. And uh, congratulations, Flexi. Now, we just turn for the judges to ask you questions. We'll start off right there. Thank you, for, thank you for the presentation. So you mentioned that you were able to digitally scale. Could you tell us more about your AI strategy, artificial intelligence? Absolutely. So at this stage, we are a people-focused company. We have our partnership with Microsoft for startups, and what that enables us to do is have large-scale data storage. And so we'll be leveraging that to find efficiencies as we go. However, at this stage, it's really about human contact and understanding our flexies and their skills and how we can best match to those to clients. All right, next question. We'll go right here. So we know that something like 90% of disabilities are invisible, so mental health and everything else. Um, so my question is, how are you engaging in that aspect of employment? And we have to make sure that people feel connectedness, right? So not just about remote work. How has that come about? Yeah, thank you, Erica. It's a real problem um, that some people are unsure about what this means. So at Flexibility, we do not be prescriptive with what disability is. We let people come to us and we help connect them with how they utilise their abilities. So in doing that, we create a really open and accepting community where they can feel more comfortable in exploring their professional careers. love this idea. Um, I work at LinkedIn, so we think a lot about marketplaces. And my question for you is one of the things we struggle with is balancing the supply and demand. So have you guys thought about how you balance the jobs available and the people available? We have certainly thought about that, and that is one of our challenges, the scalability of supply and demand at equal pace. So that is one place where hard price funding will come in useful. So on the client side, we will be doing the marketing and um, uh, business development. On uh, the talent side, we will be using platforms like LinkedIn and our partnerships with other uh, labor suppliers and scaling at equal pace. All right, Sandy, you had a question. Thanks for your presentation and, of course, even more importantly, for your work. Um, I am curious about, uh, you said that you are hiring people. Um, who is accountable for the work in the, in the line of the employer, you as a, then actually the employer, and of course then the employee? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sandy, for the question. So we employ our talent directly we are accountable for the quality of the work. So just like any other workplace around the world, when we are taking talent on and onboarding them, we are responsible for making sure that they have the skills that they need to do the work and that they're getting the support that they need to do their job properly. Janice, you also had a question? Yes, Flexi. Um, first of all, thank you. You're involved in work that I care deeply about as the founder of Act One Group. My question for you is, what are your biggest challenges and or gaps you see for the next 18 months beyond the investment? Absolutely. So this is actually something we've covered a little bit already. For us, the biggest challenge is growing our supply and demand at the same time. So that, what that means is we want to make sure all our flexies can work the amount of hours they want to work every week and all our clients can get their jobs done quickly. All right, that is it for questions. That is time for Flexi. Let's hear it for them one more time. Thank you, Flexi, for your time. Great presentation there. Next up, who will be coming to the stage, we'd like to welcome Eco Bana. They'll be making their way to the stage. We'll have one other presentation coming up here now. All right, here is Eco Bono. Let's hear it for them one more time.
Hello, we are Ekobana. They use anything. Oh, nothing at all. To conceal a monthly natural cycle tied to the puberty cycle. 65%. To many of you, this is just a percentage. But this percentage represents the number of Kenyan girls and women who are affected by period poverty. The faces you see there are the faces of the dreamers, the doctors, the entrepreneurs, and the future investors who use anything from cow dung, chicken feathers, soil, rugs, as their best definition of sanitary towels. And that's why we are here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you all to Ecobana, a simple, cost-effective, biodegradable, and hygienic sanitary towels made from banana fibers. An average Kenyan family spends $0.84 to buy sanitary towels, whereas with our product, they'll be spending $0.46. We are talking of savings over $0.38 for a family that lives below $1 a day. And we are 65% more sustainable and 45% cheaper than the existing sanitary towel in the Kenyan market today. And that price point will allow us to sustain ourselves as we'll be generating a profit of over $8,600 per month. We are using two business models, and we broke them down to three market phases. First one, when we launched the company, we sold our products in the local markets, partnered with the local NGOs and community leaders for awareness creation of our product. And phase two, as we plan to grow horizontally within Kenya, targeting schools, governments, and hospitals. And phase three, as we grow vertically within, within Eastern Africa and Africa, targeting disaster relief agencies such as the UNICEF, Red Cross, and the United Nations. We did our product testing in Nyakimincha, Limuru, and Meru, reached over 250 families, established four partnerships with local women groups and charitable organizations. We have secured over 60,000 pre-orders. As a matter of fact, we have a signed letter of intent by Discovery Brand CEO to supply over 20,000 boxes of sachets valued over $23,000. In addition, we have three government supports that both acknowledge and recommend our solution, and we are currently working on securing orders from relief agencies to Mandera refugee camps for over 50,000 individuals. But what we are truly passionate about is our impact. And we broke it down to one unit level. For every sachet we sell, we shall be empowering seven girls and women to continue with education, get better job opportunities in the future. We shall be allowing the family to increase their income up to two times and be providing a safer household environment for that family. Multiply that by the thousands of boxes and sachets we sell, and you are looking at a huge magnitude of impact. But today, Ladies and gentlemen, at exactly 1.58 p.m. New York time, Ecobana is here to ask for one million U.S. dollars to make our dreams come true. Given our wholesale business model and current demand, we predict and aim to sell more than three pads, three million pads, generating over fifty thousand dollars, employing more than two thousand people by 2024, and reaching people in more than four different countries. With our partners, Discovery Brands. Iron and St. Paul's University, Kenya. We are looking at solving problems using banana fibers. We've already started working on the future product line of Ecobana, that is installing sanitary dispensers in public toilets, schools, hospitals, favorable government facilities, and also expanding locally and internationally. And you might be wondering why we're the perfect team to reimagine and revolutionize the sanitary travels industry in Africa. As a team, we know the competitive landscape, how to build scalable enterprises, bringing quality to customers and investors. And it doesn't hurt to say that Ecobana has mentors and advisors with over 20 years experience in menstrual hygiene space, marketing, sales, and finance. And that's why Ecobana is more than just a product. It is a movement of liberations as we empower billions of girls and women to put their own fate, quite literally, in their own hands. Changing lives. Uh, we're going to go to the judges with questions. And Janice, you first. Yes. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, for representing for the women. Thank you. Thank you. This product I held in my hand and I touched about it, this would have been something that many women in my community in the Southeast would have desired as well. So my question for you is, it feels a bit recyclable and reusable. Is it simply recyclable? 
or is it washable and reusable as well? Thank you so much for that question. And, and, and I also understand that you have a woman as a part of your team whose visa kept her from being here. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for that question. And this is one of the best questions uh, that our COO, Kylie Modonio Gola, who is not here with us because of the visa complication, could answer best. Because these sanitary towels, they are not washable. The reason why they're not washable is that we are considering people who live uh, in rural areas in Kenya because wow. getting water to wash these sanitary towels will be very hard. And even when you call somebody that I want to wash my sanitary pad, we felt like no. We, do, we, we wanted something that is reusable, something we, we, that decomposes back into the environment and also conserves the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great answer. Erica, you next. Could you talk about um, how you ensure your supply chain from the input, the materials, uh, to manufacturing? How are you making sure that's kind of foolproof? Thank you so much for that question. As you can see on this, our production slide. So we have several steps. With we, we are considering also the hygienic part of these uh, sanitary towels. So the first thing we do after getting the banana stalks, we cut the banana stalks and sort them out, get the fiber from the banana stalk. After getting the fiber, the fiber is being washed, cut, and also being sterilized so that we can get banana pulp. That pulp will be grounded and will be weighed and measured in a local weighing machine that will be fit for a sanitary towel. After that, we'll con continue and make our sanitary towels, which are biodegradable. Thank you. Manish? Uh, what do you see as your uh, biggest uh, risk at this point of time, apart from the funding? Thank you so much for that question. At this point, our biggest risk, we kind of wear our risks as our byproducts. So for us, we take our risks. One of them at this moment is that Will you use our product? Because this is something that often when we take it to the, uh, to the market, when we did our social mapping, women and girls are uh, more clear that they want something that they can go green. We have women who use normal sanitary towels, but when they heard about our product, they were very excited because it is comfortable, hygienic, and it's very recycled. Uh, biodegradable, meaning it goes back to the soil because most women, too, the problem with them is that, that uh, most sanitary towels are not biodegradable, meaning even decomposing them or disposing them is, is a difficult problem to them. But ours, we have the best solution. And in addition to that, women in this building can attest that comfortability is of essence when it comes to sanitary pads. Yes. David, last question. What would you say your main value proposition is? Is it the biodegradable part? Is it cost? Is it performance? And if it is biodegradable, is the infrastructure there to take it and put it in a biodegradable fashion? Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, our main selling point is biodegradable and also comfortability. And for biodegradable, there are machines. And also, as I said, Ecobana has mentors with over 20 years experience in manufacturing. So we have the machines, but not quite uh, good machines for us to expand, uh, build many, uh, manufacture many products to reach many people. But there's, there's the machines, there's the technology, and we are harnessing that technology to make this beautiful product. And of course, we have the team that knows how to build scalable enterprises. We have the pain, we have a beautiful product, and we have you to join us in this noble quest of ending period poverty. And in addition to that, we have a heart of the world and a mind for the business. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and, and again, thank you. All right, there we go. Let's hear it one time again for Echo Bana. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, now we heard from Echo Bana. And next up to the stage as they come off is a team name that I really like, Savvy Engineers. We're going to welcome them to the stage. And before they get here, I want to tell everybody, I talked to some of these teams before we started today. And everybody said to me, hey, Dexter, I'm excited and nervous. But I don't know about you guys. I can't tell. Everybody's up here. They're doing a fantastic job. And we love what we see so far. So now we're ready to welcome Savvy Engineers to the stage for their presentation.
We, we are, are savvy, savvy engineers, engineers creating savvy solutions that sustain the environment. We are both creating employment opportunity and changing the environment. We are so fortunate to be here despite 33 million people has been affected by flood in Pakistan. And the cause is climate change. 300 million ton of plastic waste is being produced annually, out of which 8 million ton plastic ends up into the ocean, which kill 100 million marine animal each year. So everyone, have you ever imagined converting this trash plastic into an amazing 3D printing filament? We imagined it and we did it. By effectively recycling the waste plastic, we are doing a profitable business and creating jobs for both skilled and unskilled people. To develop this unique solution, we are a dynamic and a growing team of engineering, marketing, strategy, and sustainability expert. The current situation of flood in Pakistan has created a great vacuum for jobs. And we started filling this gap by offering the job opportunities to the affected people. Do you know that if you buy our one kg of spool, it will help, help you save 23 plastic bottles from being ending up in the ocean or landfill? We are doing this by following four simple steps. Firstly, collection and segregation of plastic waste, then transporting it to our facility, manufacturing 3D printing filament, and lastly, packaging and shipment. Here is our machine, which we have manufactured with our own hands with the help of following funding bodies. Let's look how this machine works. Firstly, the plastic bottles are being crushed, then they are being fed into the hopper from where it gets melted and converted into our amazing product. This amazing product is made out of recycled plastic. Having greater tensile strength, we are offering in customizable diameter and in multicolors. At the same time, it is cost effective. 3D printing is literally everywhere, whether you name it education, engineering, medical, or as a hobbyist. The global market for 3D printing and its services is worth of $15 billion, and its growth is 24% annually. Our target market is educational institutes, 3D printing companies, 3D printing users, and local retailers. So, since our launch, our product has generated $5,000 revenue from our e-commerce store. If you want our product, just grab your phone and visit our websites. Besides that, people can also earn from our website just by clicking on the, onto the donate button and selling their plastic waste to us. So everyone, if we compare our product with our competitor, our product is lower in cost, unique, made up of recycled plastic, not from the virgin one. We are selling our product approximately at the price of $8 and obtaining a net profit of $4.63. That is approximately 60% profit margin. We will be using $1 million to recycle more than a million kilograms of plastic and obtaining a profit over $7 million and expanding across 26 cities over two continents in just two years. We'll be creating jobs, we'll be creating 2,000 jobs by the end of 2024 and we'll be offering 5 to 25% more income to our employees. Moreover, we'll be doing this by establishing the plant, manufacturing the machine, and establishing and producing 3D printing filament, which will eventually help us to employ manufacturing staff, administrative staff, sales staff, and savvy segregators and cleaners. So our current partners are UNDP, UNESCO, Coca-Cola Foundation, whereas our future partners will be municipal waste management companies and Ministry of Climate Change, Government of Pakistan. We have successfully filed patent signed MOU with three different companies. We have put our research paper into publication and have won many national and international contests. Don't, Don't trash, trash our, our future. future. Let's, Let's get, get savvy, savvy together. together. Thank you. Thank you. Great job there by Savvy Engineers. We're now going to open it up to the judges for questions. We'll start off with David. Is there variability in the quality depending on the inputs of the plastic? And also, like, what's your value proposition? Is it that it's recycled? Is it performance? Is it cost? So actually, um, the plastic which we are introducing, that depends upon the quality. Like, for example, if we are introducing HDPE plastic into the, uh, our machine, then obviously we are going to get the higher quality of filament. And if you are going to introduce PET plastic, then we use re um, uh, res resins, and which will uh, improve the quality of the filament. So assuming you're wildly successful, which I hope you are, how are you going to be able to fill demand of large corporates who need, like, you know, you would want big offtake agreements for your manufacturing? So how are you going to scale? And by the way, competitive products on the filament, how, how, what's the landscape there? So sorry, I squoze in two. <laughs> 
So actually, that's why we are over here. We are um, asking a million dollars uh, to um, fill the market de market demand right now. And um, like from this machine, we are producing 50 kilograms of plastic per hour. Korea. Could you tell us more about the collection process, and in particular, if you differentiate between different types of plastics and how you reward collectors? So actually, we hire like we hire people. We pay them the amount of plastic. Like uh, for a kilogram of plastic, they are being paid 0.83 cents to 0.83 dollars, and they give it to us, and then we give it to a company which we have signed an MOU with them. They clean and segregate it and send it back to us. Hmm. All right, but Karen. We, you, oh, go, I'm sorry. Process. Continue. No, 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 go. So uh, once they give us the clean plastic, then we will use our uh, crusher machine to crush the plastic, and then we do the whole process by ourselves. Karen, you had a question? OK, so um, uh, life and business is full of surprises. And sometimes you do mistakes. How do you, as a group, deal with mistakes? We actually have very good mentors with, our, uh, with us. So they are guiding us at every step when we do mistake. And we overcome the mistakes. And right now, we are here. <laughs> Any other questions? The world is looking toward re the reduction of the production of plastic. How long a future do you see working uniquely with plastic? For the developing countries like Pakistan and Asian country, like they are producing plastic and they are manufacturing plants over there. There is no like proper regulation over there. So what we could do is that we could do our best to um, effectively recycle the best plastic which is being produced in the market as right now. Thank you. Sure. So uh, this gather collection, segregation, manufacturing, and I mean sales—they're all uh, you know uh, very, very. They're the businesses in itself. Now you're we are bringing all of them together under one umbrella and, and it's savvy engineers. Um, how how do you plan to do that? Okay, so uh, for uh, for uh, for the cleaning pr process, we have uh, signed an MOU with the company. For manufacturing, we are doing by ourselves, and for supply chain, we basically. Uh, uh, through through courier service, we uh, do, uh, do the transportation of this filament to the customers. Uh, also, they can come to our facility, like the big companies who are B two B. They come to our uh, store and they uh, buy it them by themselves. All right, let's hear it for Savvy Engineers once again. Thank you, guys. All right, next up to the stage, we are going to have Team Kose. They'll be here with their presentation. How's everybody enjoying the presentations? We are halfway through. There we go. Halfway through, and I think they've all been, as I said, very impressive. I don't see the nerves. They're doing better than me up here, so it's great to see. We're just gonna get ready in a second, and we will have the team up here. They look like they are in place, and they are ready. Our next team, Kuse, we'll welcome them to the stage. Before I begin, I would like to invite the judges to really reflect with me this year's call to action, bringing the world back to work. Are we here providing an individual a job opportunity through product-based labor-intensive manufacturing in exchange for monetary compensation? Or are we here to provide them something more than just a job, not only to earn, but to perform and produce? I'll leave this to the judges to answer. But today, my teammates and I are here to share with you all what we think this year's call to action is. This painting was actually hung in one of the hotel lobbies we work with in Taiwan. This is a co-creation by the disabilities and designers, where first disabilities will draw from their imagination and designers turn this into a co-creation, really give the disabilities a sense of empowerment, just like her. Her name is Jia Yi. She is visually impaired, but she was one of the co-creators. Through art, it really allowed her to communicate to the world eloquently. So we decided to reach out to 80% of disabilities that were not able to find a job. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Kuse. We are a platform of value creation rather than just donations and grants. On a side note, we're actually pronounced as Kuse. Kuse. 
which in Taiwanese means empowering attitude towards life, and this is our business model. Disabilities will first upload their original artwork onto our platform, and then designers will download, co-create, corporates will buy and issue the license fee back to us, Kuse, and we will distribute 25% of the revenue back to the NGOs. Now, disabilities from the NGOs will participate in workshop, but this is not just a job. In the long run, this will improve their mental health at the same time to lower the burden of their support system, creating a social impact. Co-creations not only have the business value, but at the same time, it will also add ESG score to the corporates. So we're speaking to KPMG for future ESG score endorsement. We have now been speaking to all of these multinational corporates at the moment. We are a platform mechanism that will be able to meet the demand for both NGOs and corporates, creating a sustainable ecosystem. For example, from turning this robot to a mascot issued for Taiwan Bank, or turning this subway station into an art gallery supported by our government, or turning this co-creation into this facial mask that could be worn globally. Companies license artwork for their product, packaging, and gift design. And in markets today, they're also looking for measurable ESG values, specifically in the social impact sector. And this is where we can help. Starting in Taiwan, we are expanding to other markets by working with more businesses and NGOs in creating 2,500 job opportunities through co-creation. We have so far generated more than 700,000 US dollars in revenue in Taiwan market alone, and with 1 million prize from Holt Prize, we can expand faster and stronger. Our team has the experience, the expertise, and the passion to achieve our vision. We don't know what's going to happen in the future due to a lot of uncertainties. S supply chain disruption may again put these people out of job, but we don't want this to happen again. We have enough resilience for our platform to continuously grow and sustain. So we invite Holt to join us in making this happen. Let us all bring people back to work, not only by 2024, but years after. Because just like what the billboard said when we all enter this hotel room, quoted by President Bill Clinton, we can create a culture of possibilities in a world hunger for hope. Thank you very much. Great job, Team Kusei. We have now questions from our judges. We're going to start with Kareem, right here. So I'm passionate about AI, and that's my line of work. And I have to say, recently, there's been incredible progress on AI for art. So I wanted to ask you if you see it as a threat or an opportunity, and how it will impact your business model. Thank you very much for the question, and I think that is a great question. Um, in the beginning, uh, with our platform, we are working with uh, people with disabilities or low socioeconomic uh, status, and then through co-creation with our designers um, to co-create all the beautiful artworks that can be licensed to businesses that you've seen uh, Annie presented. Um, in the second phase, we'll open this up to other designers that is not a, a part of our co company at the moment, so they can then join from all over the world to co-create. In the future, we have also thought about working with AI and cre creating different styles um, through um, AI, and then the consumers can, or the businesses can choose based on their style, um, what they like, and the AI can then transfer into the co-creation that they prefer. We don't see this as taking away any uh, opportunities, but uh, in fact, adding to the initiative that we're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, we have Janice, did you have a question? Actually, he asked most. Okay, well, we're good. Uh, we'll, I'll go with David right here. You mentioned a platform could you speak to the competitive landscape and if there's a networking effect like an Uber, Airbnb, where either artists or people that want to buy it want to be on this platform? I'm sorry, just to clarify, you meant as in other people joining our platform? The competitive landscape, is someone else doing like this, something okay. like this? And is there a networking effect where either the artists, people with disabilities will want to be on this platform? In terms of competition, we actually see it in two stages. Um, in Taiwan, because we wanted to pr uh, prove that there's a market, market and supply demand. So a lot of our competitors are more local-based creative agency. Um, we have since then see the global need of what we're providing, and we have brought our um, initiative online into a more platform-based business model. And as you can see on this uh, positioning map, that um, 
that we actually, since that we're bringing into the global platform, we are actually seeing more global competitors as well. There are actually two spectrum that we're looking at. One is the more commercial aspect, um, where there are other IP licensing platforms. And the other end of the spectrum is um, the more public welfare, um, charities and uh, the, uh, organizations like World Visions. And you can see that we position ourselves in a very unique position where we have high engagement with the NGOs and the businesses, and at the same time provide commercial IP licensing, but also uh, has that charity uh, aspect to it. And sorry, in addition to David's question, thank you very much, which is, are the disabilities willing to do this? So we're working with NGOs right now. As we all know, it's a nonprofit organization. A lot of disabilities do have their idle time. They're not utilizing it wisely because they don't know how. We are here, they don't have to be professional artists, but we are here to provide them workshops for them to create, to t communicate eloquently that normally they won't be able to do so verbally. So this is adding value in addition to what we are paying to them. So I think this is is something that we are creating all together with us, NGO, and at the same time increase demand for the corporates to step in and also to provide all these prop, um, opportunities to the disabilities. All right, we have time for one more quick question to answer. Janice. Yes, so with art, it moves across content from flat to motion content. Do you have any agency representation that works along with you for these artists, and are your artists basically flat content at this point? Um, thank you for your question. To answer this question, first of all, the art that we're looking into right now, it comes in many different forms. Actually, we have our in-house designer, which is Mark, and this is why this actually adds a lot of value to what we're doing, because he's one of the top 100 designers in the world. So be, for this, he will be participating. We also have workshops. We also have guidance materials for all these other NGOs remotely for them to really spend time to also teach these disabilities to draw and create. And then we add value to it to be bought by businesses. So for now, we're looking into this form of art first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kusei. Let's hear it for Kusei one more time. Great job. Thank you, guys. All right. Great job by them. Next up, who will be on the stage as a team? Open Versum. They will be joining us now for their presentation as they set up right here. We have two more left, guys as we're moving along pretty quickly. Judges, I know it's a tough decision for you guys. You guys have had great questions. How's it, how's it going for you guys there? Good? Thumbs up? All right, that's good. Good, good, good. Glad that we have the judges there. All right, open first and bear here on the stage. Let's hear it for them. Would you? drink this glass of water. You have the choice, but two billion people around the world do not. Maria is one of them. She lives in Sucre, one of the poorest areas of my home country, Colombia. She has never had a stable income, and she fears for her two little daughters because they don't have access to safe drinking water. In fact, every day, 700 children die due to waterborne disease. But why do we still fail to bring safe water to people like Maria? Current solutions are too expensive. For instance, the filter my grandmother uses costs more than a monthly wage in Colombia. Additionally, we saw many failed solutions in remote areas because the supply chain and the know-how are missing to repair them. That's why at Openversum, we create jobs that bring safe water with micro-franchising of cutting-edge technology. After four years of PhD and 40 prototypes, we created and patented a filter that provides water at 0.3 cents per liter. Our filter is unique. It removes pathogens, pesticides, and heavy metals. In addition, it is biodegradable and reduces tons of CO2. But the best part is it can be locally produced. With micro-franchising, we can train entrepreneurs like Maria to manufacture and sell the filter, creating ownership of the product and a sustainable business. With our platform integration, we bring this knowledge and business to many, many more. And we know we can be successful because this filter already provides water to more than 400 people who gave us positive feedback. We trained more than 10 entrepreneurs, and from Colombia, we expanded to Ecuador without setting foot there, showing our scalability. And Maria makes a perfect entrepreneur because women are key change makers in the water sector. 
and we make it easy. There is no upfront cost, and she gets a business in a box, tools, supplies, instructions to build and run a successful business. In one hour, Maria can assemble a filter according to the instructions on our platform. She can then carry out quality control and sell it to her community. Thanks for marketing strategy involving local partners and core community centers, we make her first sales easier. And those sales, together with recurring filter maintenance, lift Maria out of poverty and generate revenue for OpenVersum. Maria has now a secure source of income, and she finally makes enough money to live with dignity. And she's also becoming a role model for her daughters and her community by improving the life for more than 3,000 people with safe water. And this is just the impact of one Maria. Now imagine hundreds of Marias. And by 2024, when we break even, we will have over a thousand entrepreneurs. And these entrepreneurs escape poverty and bring clean water to one and a half million people that now regain their time to go to school or work. So each drop of clean water has a ripple effect that creates even more jobs, saves lives, and reduces 30,000 tons of CO2 just in 2024. And micro-franchising allows us to go fast and big. Starting in Latin America, we quickly expand to our partners in Africa where millions are waiting. And these local and global partners already trust us and together we'll continue to create value. With our team that combines two realities between Colombia and Switzerland with different expertise but one shared vision, which is to empower local entrepreneurs to improve their lives in their community. But time is running because climate change increases the global water problem. But the good thing is we have the technology, we have the team, and we have the business to provide millions with clean and safe drinking water. Thank you. Great job. Open first some guys. Great job by them there. We're going to open it up to the judges for questions. I'm going to start off with Meg right here. I love the micro franchising model. I think it's brilliant. I would love to hear a little bit more about your competitors, just knowing that um, you know, wire filters have been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a question that Lori normally st Laura would normally respond, but uh, because of her voice, <laughs> which I said that will cover her. So within the competitors, there's actually we outcompete all of them um, because we are cheaper priced for very high efficiency, and we remove heavy metals, pesticides, and pathogens. But in general, the problems are not only that it's um, the filter itself, but the implementation. And that's why micro-franchising, actually, our filter is designed that it can be locally manufactured by people like Maria to be distributed to the last mile, so where people really need it. Uh, Erica, you also had a question. That was exactly my question. Oh, that was exactly your question. See, something great minds think alike. Uh, Janice, go to you. Yeah, first of all, I'm going to ditto on that micro-franchising expansion model. That's incredible on so many levels. Uh, how are you protecting your patents, and how are you looking to further monetize as you move across the globe? This has potential. Yeah. I can, well, the patent comes from uh, Oliver's PhD, and uh, we want to protect it, having each filter being unique and uh, each user can um, scan a QR code and check the, um, that is verified that this is the authentic product that they're getting. And this um, integration with the, the cloud and technologies allows us to make it in the world. David? So you mentioned 3,600 a year in revenue. Is that cash in someone's pocket or is that revenue? And has that been, whatever it is, is that enough to sustain a family or a person for a year? And has it been proven? Yeah, so this is $300 um, dollars a month in Colombia is more than a, way more than a minimal wage. And actually in the rural areas where I live, they normally earn less than a minimal wage or even nothing. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So with this money, they can be able to, to live and to, uh, to give food to the families. Manish? 
Tell me a little bit about the supply chain. How are you going to get water and then, uh, you know, how is this uh, filter uh, is going to work and then how the distribution is going to happen to each household? Yeah. So let's say example how we actually do it today in Ecuador. We have a local NGO in place that actually does, does the whole supply chain. In Quito, they have a place and in the rural city, the closest city, they have the storage space. And together with local partners, we are currently having, we will do the supply chain. And the second part where we don't have a local partner yet, in each of these places has a connection to the agriculture. And so there is already a supply chain. They have a connection to the local market. We've seen that, but we just need to find them, connect with them. All right, Janice. Yes, how committed are each of you to this organization, this company, and how is that documented? Yeah, so after 40 years of PhD, I was more than lucky to find these amazing P team members because we combine so many different expertises. I don't want to talk about me, I want to talk about, so we have on the left data science, which comes from environment and engineering and now knows everything about data science. Laura, our water expertise that not only helps us to, um, to scale with water filters, but whole sanitation and and water management. And then we have impact evaluation expert and public management who helps us with all the partnerships. That, that, that's great. My question leans more in how documented are you to continue with this company were you to be given an investment? Unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for questions. Saved there, by the so bell. Saved by the bell. <laughs> Sorry, but great job. Open person. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Well done. Sorry about that, Janice. We weren't able to get that last question in. Uh, saved by the bell there. <laughs> saved by the bell indeed. Uh, our next team that will be coming to the stage for their presentation uh, is Team Breer. They have a fantastic presentation. This will be our sixth. We've moved to this pretty quickly, guys. Um, we are at the sixth and final presentation, and then all the pressure is on the judges and for us to wait and see. How's everybody feeling? There we go. Everybody enjoying their Tuesday afternoon. Just a little bit more with the setup here. This should be a good one. The judges, you have your products in place. So that looks good. Move that over there. All right, I think we are ready. Let us put our hands together and welcome Team Breer to the stage. Look under your chair. There is a surplus slice of power to change the world. We are Breer, and we believe bread is power. This is Hong Kong, Breer's home. But behind these tall buildings are 1,600 hungry, homeless people. This is in a city where 1,800 tons of bread is wasted every day. So we decided to collect this bread and donate it to the homeless. We thought we were helping, except we weren't. Ah, look, said, I don't need this. I need a job, so I never have to wait for you to give me food again. That day, we knew that bread didn't just need to feed the homeless, it needed to employ them. So we joined our quirky minds, supported by industry mentors, to learn brewing and create bread beer. This sustainable beer, made by replacing barley with surplus bread acquired for free, has already led to the hiring of 60 underrepresented individuals full-time and saved 9.2 tons of bread. We launched in August 2021 after 20 pilot brews, 30 pop-ups, and five blind tastings, and today are in over 150 stores with $500,000 in competition money. Our low asset model involves contract brewing, renting breweries machines and licenses while taking charge of the brewing value chain. Our 11 logistics heroes, who were once homeless, contribute by collecting the bread from our bakery partners. They now earn 1.6 times minimum wage. 
Next, beer is brewed. We trained 45 and hired 34 ethnic minorities to curate and execute our recipe. They have created six products. Finally, beer is packaged. So we hired 15 special needs design wizards to contribute to branding, receiving media attention worldwide. We've gained $40,000 in revenue, selling 20,500 units, each saving 0.7 ounces of bread. Tapping into the $569 million beer market, we produce our beer at $1.5 and sell B2B at $4. In 2023, we expect $750,000 through confirmed pre-orders from Starbucks and Pizza Hut. This success is because 18 to 34 year olds with a drive for sustainability and high spending power purchase Breer for its mission and repurchase Breer for its taste, branding and community. Breer is an option for 630 million individuals to drink their favorite beverage while creating impact. We innovate the world's third most consumed drink with Alfri, a non-alcoholic beer, BOC, our coffee stout, and base, our pizza crushed beer. We need the help investment for, to scale fast with plans for a Singapore launch in 2023 with confirmed brewery partnerships and have letters of intent from Panera Bread for a 2024 USA launch. By 2024, Brio will go from having $40,000 to $2.5 million in revenue. Brio will go from saving 9.2 tons of bread to saving 160.2 tons of bread. Brio will go from hiring 60 individuals to hiring 2,017 individuals. Yet, there are too many slices of power to stop. We have ready prototypes of healthy probiotic drinks made from surplus bread and supply grains forced brewing as animal feed to farmers. The slice of bread in your hands today can change the lives of many like Alok. And today, you have the power. Join us as we create taste from what was once waste, and we toast to change. <laughs> It'll be beer soon. Cheers! All right, Team Greer, thank you for that great presentation. Now it is time for our judges. We're going to kick it off with David. Thanks. If I understand correctly, you sell this can B2B to the supermarket or a place for $4. That is, I imagine that positions it as a premium product. Could you speak to how, what that is for other premium products, how much they sell to the supermarket? Slide 60, please. Sure. So we sell our pale ale, which is our beer, which is our alcoholic product for $4 right now. The costs are split into five different avenues, which include the packaging cost, which is $0.18, the logistics cost, which is $0.26, other fixed costs, which is $0.21, and labor costs, which is $0.6. Uh, moving on, um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is not a premium product in Hong Kong, where labor and rent is actually very expensive. We are $1 cheaper than any other craft beer product in Hong Kong currently. And as we scale up to countries like USA and Singapore, these costs actually come down because land is a lot cheaper in these places compared to Hong Kong. So from a pricing standpoint, you're saying you're positioned under other we're, we're more affordable, $1 cheaper. Erica? So first of all, your stuff tastes great. All right, I just sampled both, so <laughs> well you. done. Wait, my question actually two, one, how do you ensure quality control of the bread? Like, is there all mold and stuff and it's going in? Like, how do you manage that? Two, uh, shelf space, super crowded in this space. So just how are you gonna get yourself known? For the quality, we follow our quality trifecta, where first, our logistics employees do a quality check with the supplier to make sure that the bread which is coming to the brewery is safe. Then. Even if there is any surface bacteria on the bread, it gets killed due to the high brewing temperatures at 100 degrees Celsius. Even after that, the Hong Kong government does not require us, but we lab test each and every of our beers, as you can see reports, mm. and we make sure that every beer which goes out in the market is safe for human consumption. Mm. And this is how we ensure consistency in the taste. So one type of beer will only have one type of bread. So for example, the can which you just drank has only plain white bread, which we collect from different breweries, uh, bakeries, and then we make sure it's a functional replacement not affecting the taste in any future batches. Sandy. Who do you all look to for inspiration? 
all of us actually look to each other for inspiration. So I can only speak for myself here today, but I'm standing on stage with three of my best friends who've now turned into family. And the reason we began this pursuit is because we wanted to combine our individual passions in life and bring it together under Breer. The reason we support people who are homeless is because this is a problem we've seen firsthand in the city we call home and unfortunately, even in the city where we pitch today. We support the ethnic minority because as you can see, all of us are from Indian origin, but have very different backgrounds and want to empower our brothers and sisters to grasp opportunities exactly like this to make a difference in the world. And finally, we look to each other because we believe that waste is not waste until you waste it, and we've achieved so much at the average age of only 21 in our year, so uh, in our age. So there's a long way to go for us. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> well, it looks like the judges uh, enjoyed what they had there, so let's ta thank Team Breer for a great presentation. Once again, another round of applause for them. Don't worry. Don't worry. The bread under your chairs will be turned into beer very soon, so please leave it on the chairs. We'll collect it after, and hopefully you get to taste the hard work you've been a part of. Thank there you. There you go. Everybody, as Team Breer said, there are bread, bread pieces under your chair. Please leave them in the room. Do not uh, take, take them out. We want everybody to leave them in the room. So we've come to the conclusion, the end of these closing pitches. Um, and as this concludes the pitching session, we saw six tremendous teams out there, and up here, excuse me, making their pitches, and it was very well done. And they all have the potential, guys, to change the world as we saw. Now, judges, I've said it before, we know you guys have a very difficult task here, uh, but now, it's up for you to judge these teams, and we know that you are up to the task. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to take a break while the judges deliberate. For those of you in the room, we invite you to view, view and visit our showcase where the winning teams from 2020 and 2021 are ready to share the progress that they have made with all of you. And as a reminder, after the winner of the 2022 Hulk Prize is announced, you are invited to stay and watch a live stream of President Clinton's closing plenary session for the CGI annual meeting starting at 4.30 p.m. So we're gonna take a break right now and then we will hear from the judges and their decision. Thank you guys. Hi everybody. Okay, so it took us a while because the judges were so intent on making the best decision. And let me tell you, the six teams gave them a really tough decision to make. There were heated arguments, passionate defenses, um, but we do have a winner. But before we talk about the winner, um, I want to take a uh, moment to do a few little thank yous that I hope you'll join me with. First, for Dexter for having been such an awesome MC for us. I also want to acknowledge the literally hundreds of thousands of participants, campus directors, judges, experts, I see many in the room, and our volunteers who have worked so hard to make 2022 such a success. Let's have a round for them. And most especially to our Hult Prize staff who are around the world. I know many of you are watching from home and we have lots in the audience here today. It is a true privilege to work with you and this event obviously would not be possible with all of your talent and hard work. So thank you for everything you do. Okay. To announce the winner of the 2022 Halt Prize Challenge, we have a leader who has spent his career championing equity, fairness, and meaningful employment. Today, he serves President Joseph Biden as the U.S. Secretary of Labor. I am fortunate to have called him my boss when I was at the One Fund Boston, and he was serving as Boston's beloved mayor. Please welcome to the stage Secretary Martin J. Walsh.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. It's, it's, uh, we got caught up in some Boston talk there for a second. So I want to I thank Laurie. Um, thank you for, for all you do. Uh, I want to um, thank everyone at the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, I want to uh, thank all today's ju the judges as well. Now I have about, I know that you were really excited about having me speak before the awards is given out. So I have about 17 pages of speeches. So just sit back and enjoy. It's all good stuff. And when I'm done, we'll announce the winner. But no, all kidding aside, just thank you. Thank you very much. This was, um, you know, I, I found out about uh, the award, the House Prize, and, and when I, I knew about it, obviously. I didn't find out about it. But when I heard about this year's um, uh, competition, uh, 15,000 startup ideas from 2,000 universities, 120 countries, that's really absolutely incredible when you think about it. And, and it's exciting to be back in person uh, because these last two years have been difficult for so many people. And, and what it says about uh, the person, the people, all of you that meet, met the, reached the finals today, it's an outstanding achievement. So I just want, let's give each other, each of you a round of applause. That's something that's really amazing. And I'll tell you, I have a different appreciation for, for young people and talent today. You know, I, I spent, as Laurie mentioned, I spent seven years as mayor of Boston before I was a state representative in Massachusetts. And for the last two years, I've been the secretary of labor and I've had a chance to go around the country. And when you see so many young, talented people in America that want to do great things, and quite honestly, around the globe, that want to do great things, it's absolutely amazing to see. And, and I, want to, I want to just, you know, expect, as, as, as after today, I expect we'll be hearing a lot more from each and every one of you uh, in the future, and I just want you to remember the name Marty Walsh, so when I do call you and say, at your company and business, when I say, listen, I, I recognize you at an event, don't forget me, so I hope you don't. Um, but this year's call to action could not be more timely, getting the world back to work uh, by creating meaningful work opportunities. Uh, in other words, you're helping me do my job. Uh, and I was speaking earlier today, uh, we had a, an, an interview on, you know, in front of a bunch of people, and we are talking about the, the future of work and what, it, what it's like. And I was talking about how the world's different. And the pandemic did a lot of some very difficult things and bad things for us. It, it, you know, a lot of people lost their life, a lot of families are struggling. But it also did a, a lot of incredible things for us that allowed us to rethink the way we live, to rethink the way our workplace looks, to rethink the way that our, our life is and our culture is. So it has given us that opportunity. Uh, to build, build a business right now that will last, uh, will employ at least 2,000 people by 2024 while creating a positive impact is really important. Uh, this is the work of our time. Right now, as we said, coming out of the pandemic, in, in, in the many years to come, we'll continue to address all of the world's challenges. Uh, public health, uh, we obviously saw that uh, with the crisis. Um, clean energy, uh, we've seen that. The President Biden just passed uh, significant legislation uh, on the, uh, you know, the IRA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, that has a big component of that clean energy and really thinking about where we are as a, country, as a world. Uh, racial and gender equity. I don't think it's any surprise we saw in the middle of the pandemic uh, here in the United States of America when George Floyd was killed. Uh, I was the mayor of Boston and we, we were tackling that issue head on again. And I don't know how many more times that has to happen to a young black person in our country, uh, but we have to continue to address that. And if you take that around the globe, it's happening all over the place. We have work to do. Uh, they all depend on creating opportunities for working people to thrive. Uh, the focus of, of the President, Pre President Biden's administration is, is that. Uh, President Biden laid out a plan in the beginning of his administration to, to bring people back to, back to work. Nearly 10 million Americans that were out of work during the pandemic have come back to work. Uh, it's, the President also started with uh, public health, addressing public health through the American Rescue Plan, making sure before they became controversial, all of a sudden, I remember when the beginning of the pandemic happened, everyone said if there was a vaccine, we'd take it. And then when we get the vaccine, everyone's, half the people saying we've complained about the vaccine. But President Biden got 280 million vaccines into arms in America, something that was really important and also worked around the, around the, around the globe. He also turned our infrastructure investment to rebuild our communities and make more growth possible. Follow that up with the CHIPS and Science Act about research and development and creating job manufacturing here in the United States of America. Follow that up with the Inflation Reduction Act, a focus on clean energy production, project, production excuse me, through innovation and good jobs. Each of these measures uh, addresses a major challenge by creating good jobs for working people. But we don't create good jobs from the top down. We create partnerships with the private sector. And that is going to be very important for our economy as we move forward. By, creating, by promoting innovation and investment, 
At the Labor Department, our purpose, my, one of my jobs is to support working people. We launched something called the Good Jobs Initiative. We partner with private sector employers to make jobs being created that are providing meaningful opportunities and a good quality of life for people that get those jobs. But the fact is, in the United States and across the world, we're just getting started. The impacts of the pandemic are still being felt very unevenly. Generations of inequality continues to put millions of workers around the world uh, at a disadvantage, often due to their race, their gender, or their disability status. Climate change is already upon us, one of the issues that we talk a lot about. And we have to make sure technology is being used to empower our workers, not exploit them. So the work that all of you have done to meet this call to action is exactly what our world needs. And I want you just to think for a minute, as a government official working in a presidential administration, I want you to understand the impacts that this competition, what you've done, is going to have on the rest of the world. You are focused on creating jobs and lifting people up rather than holding them down and provide people with the dignity of making a difference in their community and in the world. The fact that so many brilliant young people came together, have put their talents and energies into this goal gives me tremendous hope for the future of our world, not just the United States, but of our world. So I want to thank each and every one of you and all, everyone in this room once again for all that you've done. I know that in some ways you're competitors. My, my remarks say competitors. I don't like to say, use the word competitors. You're actually moving our world forward. I want to say thank you for that. And um, I get to announce the winner in a minute, but I have to do some house cleaning things first. I have to bring the ju judges. Where are you? Come on up here, judges, please. Now, if you notice, we bring the judges up before we give the award out, because we brought up after giving the award out, they wouldn't get the same applause. Are they here? All right, now, I've never done this before, announce a winner. I've never been handed a card. <laughs> I've only watched the Oscars and CM Country Music Awards, MT M Music Awards, so if I screw up anything, just don't tell anybody. Okay. And the winner is Eco Banner.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, to the judges and dignitaries, uh, I want to appreciate them for believing in us. And this win is not only for us, this win is for our sisters and your daughters. Uh, we believe in changing the lives of girls are all over the world. And we thank you. I'm very happy for this. And I really appreciate Thank you. And, and one more thing, one more thing before I leave this. Uh, I want to challenge men that uh, menstrual space and menstrual hygiene is not only a woman's problem to solve. It's high time men to stand up uh, on a global stage and talk proudly about menstrual hygiene. It is not a problem for women only. This is a human problem and menstrual hygiene is a human right. We should believe in our girls, we should give them the opportunity. Menstrual taboos and period poverty is not only a problem for women. Let's stand up as men and support our girls. It is through us that we will end this period of poverty. And thank you. Um, wow. Uh, two, uh, two years ago, when we started brainstorming about this idea, I remember when we asked our lecturer the first question, do you think it's possible? Uh, she said, do you think it's possible? So we were like, okay, we, all of us, we don't know. So we had to go back and start uh, do research about this idea. And today, we are standing on this global platform, which we have missed twice now, and this is the third time, and we did it today. I'm grateful for the whole Prize family. Uh, they've been an amazing people ever since we met them, since we started our journey with them, our judges. Most of them are here with us. I was, so, I, I was so happy and so nervous that none of them was going to be here, but when we saw all of them here, I was like, yes, they're here to support us. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very grateful um, for everybody. Uh, this win is also for Kylie. She's watching back at home. I know they are excited in that room. Yeah. yeah, and... Uh, through all the problems we've been through, we've taken them as challenges because we didn't manage to pitch uh, our idea to, at the Global Accelerator face to face, we were online, and it was difficult. If you know the Kenyan time and the Boston time, you know when you guys are taking lunch, for us it's like super, super uh, early in the morning, AM, uh, 1 AM, 2 AM, so we had to keep up with that. I want to thank our parents, they've been very supportive for somebody to come up with such a crazy idea in Kenya and tell your parents you want to do it, apart from education, they'll tell you you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> but today we are here and we proved that uh, it's doable uh, to anybody with, if you believe you can change the world just one click away, you can do it. So I'm very uh, proud of my team. We've, uh, we have a story. <laughs> so yeah. Congratulations to us, congratulations to all of us, all the winners. We are all winners. Yes, we are all winners. Let us impact the world together. Thank you so much. Wow, wow. Um, first and foremost, uh, a big thank you to God, because through him, we've managed to be here in New York, and now we've won the global uh, finals 2022. Then a big shout out to St. Paul's University, Kenya, because it has really supported us through yes. this. Yeah, it has really supported us. And also to our parents, uh, to the, uh, uh, our friends, our mentors and advisors. Special thank you to Madam Justina Mutale and Gemma Bulos. Thank you so much. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot has been done for us to be able to pitch this. And as I said in the pitch, what we are truly passionate about is our impact. As we'll be empowering, for every sachet we sell, we shall be empowering seven girls and women to continue the education, get better job opportunities, and employ more than 2,000 people. And not by 2024, it's by 2023, we shall employ more than 2,000 people. So thank you so much, even to the Halt Prize team, uh, to Narisa, to Janice, to all of them, to Hamdi, thank you so much. Cooper, thank you so much. 
yeah, Caitlin, thank you so much. And uh, as I finish, as I finish, let's remember every day a girl is born and every day a girl begins her menstrual cycle. Thank you. Wow, how exciting is today. I'm so thrilled to be able to stand here in front of you and represent the beauty that is the Holt Prize. And I know we're gonna see great things, not just from Ecobana, but from all of our finalists. So let's give them one last round of applause. For I know there's a huge party happening in Nairobi right now, so Nairobi, we see you. Thank you for joining us from all around the world, all our friends who've been online patiently waiting, some of you staying up until the middle of the night. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to close our program now. Uh, for those of you in the room, you're welcome to stay and watch President Clinton's closing plenary. Um, but to all who came out and supported the teams and for everyone who pitched today, we are eternally grateful and we wish you all the best for the rest of your night. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night.